Hello, everyone. This is Gabrielle Johnson with episode number four of Behavior Bites. And today I'm here with Dr. Alex Dahlgren of Loving Kindness Veterinary Care. And so Dr. Dahlgren is from Georgia, um, a, a doctor of veterinary medicine from UGA. Um, Dr. Dahlgren is certified in medical acupuncture for veterinarians um, uh, and, and did that in 2008. So you've been practicing a while. I know you did acupuncture with Joe um, a few years ago. Also certified in hospice and palliative care, um, which is what loving kindness veterinary care provides is that um, uh, in-home uh, end of life care. Um, uh, also fear-free elite certified and certified in low stress handling. So all of the things that we love to talk about when we're talking about cooperative care and low stress um, vet visits for our dogs. And I'm just so excited to have you here, Alex. Thank you for coming. Excited to be here. So I just think that the work that you do is endlessly fascinating. And anyone who has ever heard me talk about my dogs has probably heard me talk about the wonderful care that you have shown them. And, and Jolene, when uh, when she was in the last years of her life, you you helped make her quality of life just incredible. And so I rave about you all the time. Tell us what brought you into this work. This is quite a niche. So, so tell us about that. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, I'll give you the median size story. <laughs> it's only 15 minutes. I could talk about it a long time. <laughs> um, I, my own dog, Leela, um, who I had from before I was a veterinarian, um, and she was a very active dog and actually um, was actually a working dog for a very short period of time before I started vet school. And um, we would run and bike and hike together. Um, and she just was a super athlete. And probably, I was probably not as careful with the kind of activities that we did. And she did get arthritis in her um, wrist, basically, at a pretty young age. And so I um, sought out care for her and I wasn't getting the answers I wanted from the vet school. Um, the orthopedic surgeons were not as helpful as I wanted at the time as a student. And so I sought out a um, veterinarian who was certified in rehab and physiotherapy and acupuncture. And she did some more like physical medicine type modalities on Leela that made a big difference for her. Um, and then I moved to Virginia once I was a veterinarian and I could not find somebody who did those kinds of things. And so I decided I would go get trained in acupuncture myself. And I did. Um, and Leela was never a great acupuncture patient. So I didn't actually do a lot of acupuncture on her. She did not appreciate it very much. And, um, but once I became certified, I started treating a lot of older dogs. Um, with, with acupuncture and um, became very intimately familiar with the owners and their situations and their struggles because acupuncture is so time consuming and you have to do it so frequently. And I just developed a real um, love for being able to spend that time with them, helping them, talking to them. Um, and most of them were older guys at the end of their life. Um, and then, Leela did eventually, um, she did get cancer and um, went through that process of trying to figure out what kind of treatment I wanted for her and, and changed my mind a few times. And it was all very confusing, um, even for somebody who had all the answers um, in theory uh, and just realized what, um, what a challenge it is to navigate those kinds of decisions for a pet, you know, just because of her personality and who she was. Um, some really tough, I mean, it's tough for everyone. So that once I had gone through that, I realized how much I wanted to help other people with that. And, and that's what led me to um, hospice palliative care. That's just an amazing journey. And like, I just have to say again, you know, to everyone listening, like you are just, it, it takes such a special person to do this 
kind of work. I mean, the, the, the things you're talking about require like such empathy and compassion and such like a, such a big emotional cup. And it's just, it's so incredible. Um, and I love the story of Leela. Um, yeah, that's her. I don't know if you can see her on the wall back there. Hi, Leela. Oh, hi, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, that's so yeah. wonderful. That's so <laughs> wonderful. What a lucky pup to have you. And we in Richmond are very lucky. You know, you talked about kind of it's so hard. And I can, we, right before we you know, started recording, we were talking about like all of our professional things kind of go out the window sometimes when it comes to our own dog. We're like, you know, yes, I know what to do in a professional context, but like, this is my baby. And um, I remember when we were, we were making decisions and you were being so helpful in guiding me to make my own decisions about Jolene's health when she was older. And I remember we were scheduling the euthanasia. Um, uh, and I remember asking you, I was like, how do I schedule this? Like, do I clear my schedule? <laughs> like, how does one do this? And so I know having your support, I can't even imagine, uh, you know, doing that without having someone's support and guidance in that who knows that process. And so I think the, the, you know, the value that you bring to this city is just so incredible. I want to make sure everyone wow. listening knows that. Um, so, you know, if, if anyone else is, is kind of in the same boat that we might be as pet parents, they might be wondering right now, how do I know if my dog needs something like acupuncture? How do I know if I need to seek out um, a specialist? You know, what is my dog's quality of life? How do we measure that? So um, those are a lot of big questions, but how, how might dogs start to show that they're in pain or uncomfortable or, or that there's something going on? Yeah. Um, Changes in behavior, that's the biggest marker of pain. You know, pain is something that happens in our brains. Um, it's what I always try to remind people that we think of it, we think of it as something that happens in our bodies at the source of um, the pain. Like if you have arthritis in your hip, you think of having like hip pain. And that that's true um, to it, it's true in one sense. Um, but the pain that the animal perceives happens in the brain. Ultimately, it, the signal comes from the hip, of course. But so, so it changes their brains. <laughs> um, it changes the way they move their body. It changes the way they hold their body. Changes what they're willing to do. Um, it changes how you know their focus, what they're able to be interested in. Um, everything it can change their appetite um can make them grumpier it can make them sleepier um so i think any behavior change in an older dog is worth investigating even if it's not pain like it's older dogs don't suddenly develop in general don't suddenly develop um uh, separation anxiety. Um, that's not something that we see in an older dog to suddenly happen. And so if that happens, if there's, there's probably something else going on physically for that dog that led to that sudden change and not wanting to be left alone. Um, not, it may not be pain, but that would be the first thing that I would, for me anyway, and of course that's what I do. So maybe there's some bias there, but um, that's the first thing that I look for is like, well, what, what could be going on that might make this dog have a more difficult time handling this? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, that's spot on with what, you know, and obviously not coming from the medical side, but a lot of times you can imagine, you know, I'm getting clients who are coming in with behavioral issues and it's always, you know, first thing that we recommend as trainers or behavior consultants, you know, when there's been a sudden shift in behavior and especially with our older guys, like you said, where we're like, hmm, we're not really going through like, you know, those younger years where there's a lot of developmental changes and we expect to see, you know, increased emotions or, or you know, increased body sensitivity, like in our adolescence. When we're getting older, a lot of times the first thought is you should maybe talk to your vet about, you know, ask them, ask them, you know, what might be going on, share with them what you're seeing and what we're seeing. Um, I know, you know, with Cyan, um, I've had him on the Instagram. You, thank you again. I'll say on the video for all your help yesterday. Um, you know, but behavior change with Cyan, and I know 
when when we were first trying to figure out some of his his pain things it wasn't that he was obviously painful he was still hiking and running and he was eating normally um but we saw increased sound sensitivity but we saw the creation of sound sensitivity he wasn't before um restlessness um uh and this like explosive uh, escalation of resource guarding behaviors um and you know on the surface that all seems very behavioral but the the answer was that there was some pain or discomfort that we were able to manage in working with you and 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 our our general practitioner which was so cool um yeah that's i think that's so important i i agree with you that like a lot of times I just love what you said about pain happens in the brain. Um, I, I think that's something really important to remember and really helpful yeah. to remember. Um, so what can be done? So we notice these changes, or maybe we do notice some physical discomfort. Maybe the dog's not jumping on the sofa anymore or is struggling you know, to get up after a nap. What should be the first step? And then, and then kind of what do some of those treatment plans look like? Yeah, I think, so I think like you said, you know, with cyan, we weren't really sure that that's what was going on. Um, and, and so you you consulted with some people who um, could help you kind of work through that. And I, I think that's important um, just to reach out to your veterinarian because of course there are other things that could be going on. Um, and you did that, like you, you know, we, we checked other things like blood work and, and that's important just to make sure it's not like, you know, kidney failure or something else that may be making them feel off. Um, but if we feel like it might be pain and we're going to try to treat that, um, there's of course lots of different medications that we can use to treat pain depending on its source and how long it's been going on. Um, there's a variety of choices when it comes I mean, their pain medications are probably some of the, um, the favorites among the ph pharmacological companies. So there's a lot of those out there. Um, we talk a lot about with the older guys who have chronic pain that we know we're not going to cure, we know we're not going to make it go away. It's, it's, we might be able to put them on some pain medication and make them a little more comfortable, but um, we can't eliminate it. So adjusting their environment to make it a little easier for them. So if they're struggling with going up and down the stairs, um, maybe considering like putting some um, runners on the stairs so there's better traction or um, you know raising their food and water bowls to elbow height so it's a little easier for them um, things like harnesses to help give them a little support when we're trying to get them in and out of the car um, and then things like um, which like you are very good at helping people with the social emotional aspect which is you know I'm a little I'm older and I'm a little bit more um, a way I have pain and I don't want like my younger sibling like you know bouncing all over the place um so having separate places for like the older dog to like be while the younger sibling is being goofy or whatever where they can feel safe and relaxed and not have to worry about getting stepped on um it, kind of respecting you know their needs in that regard it's like um, you know, yeah, they're grumpier, but like, there's a reason why they're grumpier about, um, people touching them or handling them certain ways. Um, we do often, there is a, a lot of time, I mean, a lot of our pets are overweight. <laughs> so, um, sensitive subject sometimes, but, um, that extra weight can make a big deal in the long term for dogs with joint issues. And so that's something that will I think all veterinarians will harp on um, as much as they feel like they can without upsetting and hurting feelings. Um, and then we also do a lot of physical medicine and we talk about physical medicine, it's um, the non-pharmacological stuff. So when we misuse our body um, chronically, so we're not, um, we're not using our back legs as well as we should because they hurt. And so we're overusing that front part of our body um, we get up off the floor instead of pushing up with our back legs or pulling up with our front legs. And we develop this chronic tightness um, and muscle pain in our chest and our upper back. And um, maybe, you know, one hip we're holding up all the time because we don't want to put weight on it. We get tightness and pain in our glutes and our lumbar spine from that kind of hitch. 
Um, and so things like massage and acupuncture, laser um, rehab therapy, yeah, once they are a little bit more comfortable trying to get them to stretch those things out and, and, and to use their bodies a little bit better, build some strength back into those back legs so they can push themselves up off the floor again. Um, all of those kinds of things can be helpful at addressing that. We call it myofascial pain, um, which is basically like, you know, like when we sit in a car all day and we have poor posture and our shoulders hurt and our neck hurts, it's that kind of pain, the kind of pain that's not going to respond to ibuprofen because it's not inflammatory, it's muscle tightness. Um, that's so cool. That's yeah. so cool. Um, I always, I'm a big fan of the acupuncture. I love, because it feels zen for me too. It's like, all right, we're going to like set up like this, you know, I'm bad at times, but like 30 minute session and the dog's going to lay there and I'm going to lay there and you're going to talk quietly to us. And it's just very, it's very zen for everyone. Um, I love that. I love that. Um, you know, and this is, and to be fair, Alex, I'm so sorry. I didn't let you know I was going to ask this question, but it just came to me. So I hope you'll, um, entertain me. Do you ever find, I, I find sometimes, um, not even on, and I'm not even on the medical side of it, but sometimes there's a resistance. I'll see even to have that conversation with the vet, almost as if I think sometimes there's this, um, not my dog, my dog's not old. <laughs> you know, my, my dog's not slowing down. Um, what would you say to folks who might be having kind of that emotional conflict over, you know, does my dog need this support? Um, yeah. So I think that we see pain in um, every age. Like, I mean, we see pain in young dogs, adolescents, even um, they have orthopedic problems. Um, mm -hmm. And you will see these dogs, you know, and develop behavior issues and, um, you know, difficulty with stairs and just all kinds of different, they're not, you can tell they're not moving their bodies correctly. They're not sitting correctly. They're, um, I say correctly, they're not you can tell they're compensating in some way. Um, and they can be very young, especially, you know, so many of our patients nowadays have been adopted from shelters and um, we don't know their history. And some of them have old injuries that we don't know about, but we can, we can tell by watching them move and observing them that something's not right. So I think that it's not just the old guys, for sure the old guys have used their bodies more and are more likely to have, mm -hmm chronic pain, but um, we see it at every age. I think, um, I think that one of the trickiest parts about pain, especially chronic pain that's subtle um, and early, so we like mild to moderate chronic pain, is that it's unlikely that a veterinarian in the exam room is gonna pick up on that if the owner doesn't bring it up or mention it. Mm -hmm because usually when you're at the veterinary hospital, um, they're excited to be there. There's new people, there's treats, maybe they're a little scared, but they're not gonna behave normally. Um, if they do have a painful hip that normally would prevent them from jumping, they're gonna forget about it and they're gonna jump up on the veterinary. I mean, they're gonna do things that they wouldn't normally do. Um, and when the veterinarian's touching them, they might be a little nervous and scared and they might do that kind of freeze response where they're not gonna give you that kind of pain response that maybe if they were at home and their owner were touching them, they would they would let them know that, hey, that hurts. I'm not, I'm not saying like being aggressive, but just moving away from it um, or looking back at them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it, it often comes down to when we're talking about picking up on chronic pain um, that's not severe, it's something that we need the owner's observations and um, we need them to pick up on it usually to, to recognize it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I love, I love, thank you so much for bringing up that, that this is not just a senior dog issue. We can have pain at any stage and, and it's something that we should be aware of um, at every stage. And I also, I love your point that um, because I think I find that that's sometimes I knew that that was a misconception that I had initially was, um, you know, well, my dog was just at the vet and the vet said, my dog is fine. So things are probably fine. And it's like, well, the vet is doing, and, and please correct me if I have any of this wrong, but you know, we're at our annual exam, the vet's doing their typical once over. We're looking for like lumps and bumps and 
you know, over signs of things, we're doing maybe some annual blood work or we're doing, you know, our heartworm test, our fecal, we're doing, it's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, our, our annual checkup at the doctors and at, you know, in our human doctor, we would say, oh, by the way, you know, I've got this pain, my, you know, my knee keeps yes. slipping out every time. Yes. And our doctor's not going to pick up on that unless we say, hey, my knee is constantly slipping out, you know? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what I always try to tell people is that when we're talking about, well, I think he's fine. I don't think he's in pain. I don't really, um, and it's always, the question I always ask them is, how much pain would you have to be in for me to be able to recognize that you're in pain mm. just by hanging out with you for five minutes? Mm. And the answer is a lot of pain, <laughs> a lot of pain um, for another person. A lot of cr the chronic, if it's chronic pain, obviously if like you just broke your leg, like that's different. But if you have like chronic hip arthritis and you've had it for years for, a stranger to walk into a room and be like, wow, that dog, that dog looked like he has some pain. It's severe. And so for a veterinarian to tell someone, I think your dog's in pain, um, it's probably pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's such a helpful perspective. That's super, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much that this has been such great information. And even like, I knew what we were going to talk about and I'm still like sitting here, like processing. Um, that's so wonderful. So we could talk more and more and more, and I hope that you'll come back and talk to me more sometime. Sure. Um, but <laughs> for now, we'll wrap things up. Um, where can folks find you? What cool things are you doing? And what now that folks have kind of listened to this and, and gleaned all this new information, what should they do? Leave us with a, a call to action. Um, well, I think if you're if they're interested in hospice and palliative care, if they already know what's going on with their pet and that's something that they feel like would be helpful, then um, I would go to our website, lovingkindnessvet.com, um, or they could email us, um, which is info at lovingkindnessvet.com. Um, if you're not, if you're, you've heard this talk and you're kind of thinking like, maybe my dog has something going on, like some of these things sound familiar, then I would reach out to your primary vet because I think they're going to be the ones who know you best and know your dog's history best. And they're going to be able to kind of help you work through that. Awesome. And I will have your website and contact info in the description of everywhere that I put this video. Um, and I will, um, uh, well, I'll save that for another chat. I was like, wait, one more thing. Nope, we're done. We're good. Alex, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, you. This has been fantastic. You. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.